We're going to be looking this morning at God's legislative body. And I believe that you will find absolute exact, exactly what that's all about. I want to open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you. Father, we just surrender to you and we thank you for every, uh, everything you've done thus far and everything you're continuing to do and all that you will do. And so, Father, I'm asking that you take every word that was spoken. And, Father, if it not be of you and not bring glory to you, let it not be heard by your people. But, Father, anoint your word, salt it with an anointing. Let it take residence in our heart and continue to armor us for the benefit of being vic victorious as we walk out this week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. All right. How many of you have been watching the Pirates? Jordan, I, I'm asking you directly. How many have been watching the Pirates? Pittsburgh Pirates. I know that, what, six in a row? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, how many of you are sports fanatics? Anybody? How many of you are sports enthusiasts? Okay. Now, how many of you really like to watch a good contest on TV? You know, a contest, any kind of sports event, is always either between two people or two teams, right? So, with that said, some are so ex exciting, they're so dynamic. Have you ever really sat where you're on the edge of your seat by watching a chess match? <laughs> Nobody? How about if you're watching a tennis match? No? No? You know, I tell you what, when you watch a lot of sports events, if you watch baseball and you watch football, you watch a variety of hockey, there's a lot of cheering and a lot of roaring. Raw, raw and going on, but when you watch hockey, it goes like this. Hockey. Not hockey. <laughs> golf. It goes like this. Well, okay, with my brain, come on. Here. When you're watching golf, if you're watching golf, even even the announcers, the commentators, they're not even anywhere near the course, but they talk like this. Uh -huh. the, the, you know, watching golf is already boring enough, uh -huh. but then you have to listen to them whisper. Well, Tiger Woods is there on the 13th hole, and he's got a 6 iron. But wait a minute, he's going back to his bag, he's contemplating, should I take out the 7? And that's how they talk. And that's how the whole game, that's how the whole contest goes, amen? But other, other events, other types of sports events, they're loud. How many of you enjoy watching baseball? Now, a lot of people say, well, baseball, come on, anybody like to watch baseball or something? Yeah! But a lot of people don't like it because they say baseball is boring. Well, if you think baseball is boring, then sit through a nine-inning game where one of the pitchers threw a perfect game. You know what that means? Nobody on the other side got a hit, nobody got walked, and nothing happened. You paid money to sit in that, that seat for nine <laughs> solid hours, for nine innings, two to two and a half to three hours, and saw nothing happen. That is the epitome of boring, amen? But when you watch football, yeah. oh my! When you watch football, yeah. things change. Yeah. Because not only is there a lot of brawling and wrestling on the, on the field, there's a lot of brawling and wrestling in the stands, right? Because people come and they either are cheering with such a, uh, such a, a, a tenacity for their team in the stands, and or most times, which is true, they're drunk. And because they're so drunk, they don't care who's winning, who's losing. They forgot who their home team fan base is. They just want to fight somebody. And so you see that there's a lot of brawling going back and forth. But with football, football is an ecstatic, exciting event. Because people, we kind of have, we don't want to bleep, we don't want to admit it, but we kind of have a Roman Colosseum attitude. You know why you watch football? Because you want to see somebody get hurt. Come on. The only reason why you watch football is because you say, oh my God, they got a concussion. Did you see how hard he got hit in the head? But you loved it. There was a time about 12 years ago, a man got hit so, I forget his name, he was a quarterback. He got hit so hard, his cleat got stuck in the mud, and his leg got cut in two. It didn't come off. But the bone of the, of the upper bone went into the mud. And everybody was going, they were grimacing, oh my God. But they loved it because they showed the, the replay about 30,000 times. Because we have this animal instinct in us. That's why we like football. And when you think about football, now I love things about football. I don't like all the I don't like all the, the you know the hard stuff. I don't want to see anybody get hurt. At least I don't believe I do. But once in a while it's okay. <laughs> but I like football and I don't I don't I don't claim that I know all the the reality of the sport. I don't know all the rules, the regulations, 
But I love to see the stellar uh, abilities that these men have. That they are able, somebody can throw a spiral pass 80 yards down the field, and somebody's running full steam and catches it off the tip of their fingers and runs it in for a touchdown, or a halfback or a fullback is plowed into a whole line of defense players that are 280 to 350 pounds, and he's able to barrel them over, and he's able to spin and twirl and get into the end zone. Those kind of things really are the, the excitement of what I enjoy football all, all about. But when you watch football, what you're actually seeing on any team, whether it be on a professional level, whether it be a college level, or even a high school level, you see two teams that have come together, and you find that there's the home team. Now, the home team is supported by the home fans. They are applauding their home team. We have the Steelers, don't we? And I don't know if you enjoy the Steelers or not, but that's all we have. So we have the home team. And so not only are we supporting and applauding the Steelers, but we have those uh, stellar, super, uh, stellar superstars that are on the home team. We have the Ben Roethlisberger's, Le'Veon Bell. Uh, we have An Antonio Brown. We have, we have certain ones that they have such stellar athleticism that when you see them perform, they go beyond the norm of what other players can do. And so a lot of the fan base, they really get into certain few players that we're excited about. And so that's what happens when a home team is on the field. You have the fans that are supporting the home team. But then you have the visiting team who are the enemy. They come and they come on the turf. And then you come to find that these two teams, once the whistle blows for the beginning of the, the game, there's a constant conflict that is going on on that field. You have one team wanting to go this way, and they want to chew up as much yardage and take off the clock as much time as they can so that they can score and outscore the other opponent. But then you have this team, they're trying to block them, they're trying to hold them back, and when they get the ball, they're going to do the same thing. They want to take up as much yardage and take so much time off the clock as they can because ultimately they want to, one of them, want to win the game. But then you have to understand as you watch that football game, there is a third team on that, on that field that you probably are not even paying attention to. And what it is, it is the team of officials. And the team of officials don't belong to the home team. They don't belong to the visiting team. They belong to the league office of the National Football League Association that is located at 300 Park Avenue in New York City. And the, the, the team office, they set the guidelines of how the, the games are going to be played within the confines of the rules and regulations. And they give it over to their representatives, who are the officials, and they carry it out accordingly. Now the team officials, they are on the field, but they're not of the field. They are there amongst the mess, but they're not a part of the mess. Amen? Their job is to take the guidelines of what has been handed to them from New York City's office and bring order to the chaos. Does it make sense? Well, the reason why I said all that is because we are living in a time in our lives as like no other time, I believe, in history where there is chaos in our society, in all societies all over the world. But God knew exactly what he was going to do long before, and he brought his third team down on the field. It's the field of life. And the third team that he has is made up of men and women who are sold out to Jesus Christ, and they are the ones that are part of what we now know as the church. Amen? We are members of the church of Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are on the field, on the earth, but we're not in the earth. We're not a part of this kingdom. We are here uh, on, the, uh, 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 on the earth of uh, the society we live in, but we're not of this domain. We're not of this domain. We are of a higher domain. We are of a kingdom that is much higher and much greater. Amen? But we are only here for a temporary time. When you look at the, the officials of the NFL, they are given a handbook. And the handbook gives them the rules and regulations of how they are to preface every play. And they are, refer they are to reference that play according to the guidelines that have been given to them. We too have been given a handbook. It is called the Bible. 
And every, everything that we do in this field of life is predicated on God's Word. If you find an NFL official goes out from under the rules and regulations of the NFL, he is not going to be supported by the NFL. If a Christian goes out from under the rules and regulations of God's Word, our Savior is not going to support you as well. Amen? Amen. And you come to find that the NFL officials, the league officials, they're not worried about if the fans like them or dislike them. They don't care if the teams like them or dislike them, or even if the coaches approve of them or disapprove of them. They are only there to bring, to bring a, a smile and joy on the face of the commissioner. The commissioner is the head of the office of the NFL. His job is to affirm that all the guidelines are being appro appropriately attended to by the representatives who are the league officials. So they make sure that they put a smile and a joy in the heart of the commissioner. You, as part of the church, we are not to be so concerned about pleasing men. We are to be concerned about pleasing our Lord and our Savior. Amen? But I want to talk to you for a moment about the church. I want you to understand something about the church. You and I, God didn't create us and put us in a church. How many of you know that? He created you individually. Every one of you are individualized and there's no two like you. No two or ever has ever been like you, is ever like you, or will ever be like you. Now my children and my family tell me, thank God there's nobody like you. <laughs> now, I don't know how to take that. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10 that we have been created God has created us as the workmanship of God yeah. in Christ Jesus unto good works. And of course, you know the word workmanship means masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. When God created you, he sat back and he said, I will not create another like you. And matter of fact, you are so unique in the eyes of God. That's why no one before you or at the time right now that you're alive, or even when you die and someone comes after you, will ever have the same DNA that you have. No one else will ever have the same fingerprints that you have. And I don't care if you're part of an identical twin, that your identical twin, everybody says, well, I can't tell them apart. But I want you to know that there's some kind of feature in the facial feature that separates one from another. Because you are unique. And what God did once he had created you, he gave you a unique assignment. Then he took you and he, he uh, strung you into a family unit. And the family unit is there so as to support you, to contend you, to nurture you, to bring you up properly that you would be a, a person of quality in, in society. But then what God did is he put you in the family unit. He took the family unit and brought the family unit into the church. So that every individual in the family unit would have an understanding of what their true call, what their true uh, design is as to what God intended for them in the kingdom of God. Because ultimately, God wants every human being to come into his house so as to be able to find out what is their call as they are part of the legislative body of the kingdom of Almighty God. Amen? And so when you, when you see all that, know all that, then you come to realize the church is not just a place where you come for a time of having once a week inspiration, but the church is much more than what you could even imagine. Now let me show it to you. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, starting with verse 13. The reason I'm giving Matthew chapter 16 to you for is because Matthew 16 is the very first place where the word church was ever mentioned. There's something in the Bible that is called the law of the first mention. It's called the hermeneutics. In other words, when you see a word in the Bible, and you see what the divine revelation of that word is, then you find that wherever you find that word throughout the Bible, it will, have, it will hold the same revelation to it. For example, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Adam knew Eve. The word knew is past tense of the actual word know, but the word know, or knew, or have known, it's all the same. It means intimate relationship. Adam had intimacy with his wife, and out of the productivity of that intimacy were children. Their first, the first was called Cain, and then Abel. The reason I know that is because the Bible says so. 
<laughs> Stay with me, guys. Every once in a while, i got to make sure you're awake. But anyhow, the same word, no, is also find, found in Philippians 3.10, where Paul turned around and said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Right. The word no is the same thing. I want to I wanna have a more intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, I will have resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead that I could have it as well, Paul is saying. Let me stop there for a moment. I want you to realize, as we talked last week, you are not going to have that kind of intimacy with Christ but just by coming and tasting of the appetizer on any given Sunday. It's when you get deeper into the Word of God in the privacy of your life, that's when God will begin to expose certain nuggets and certain treasures to you, whereas you will have, a, you will have grown into a greater intimacy with Christ Jesus. When you get, gain that kind of intimacy, you will have resurrection power. What's that mean? It means that even though you may still have the problem, the problem won't have you. You will be able to step upon, stand over, walk over the circumstance, walk over the negative situation, walk over the sickness, walk over the financial disarray, and you won't be bugged by it. You won't be bothered by it. Because Christ will have shown you that I am with you, and if I am with you, what can possibly be against you? Amen? Amen? So you come to find that there's this one word throughout the Bible, whatever you find, it's the word, it's the law of the first mention. And the reason I bring up Matthew 16 is because it's the first place where the word church is mentioned. Look at verse 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He's asking them, What is the opinion of society? How do they perceive me? Verse 14 it says, So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say that they believe you're Elijah, others believe you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Even though they had complimentary statements, because every one of the ones that they had mentioned that they thought all the people thought he was, they were great and mighty warriors in the kingdom. But, and it was complimentary, but they were all wrong. Because when you take every saint that had power from heaven, from Elijah to Jeremiah to whomever, you will find that all of them put together, unified, are nowhere near equal to that of Jesus Christ. He was far greater than the combination of all those that were in either Old Testament or New Testament combined. In verse 15, he said to them then, he said to the disciples, but who do you, see the word you there is plural. But he said, who do you say that I am? He's asking the whole group, what is your thoughts of me? You've been with me now for two years. How do you see me? What is my per perception of, of you, uh, toward you? And you come to find in verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ. I'm going to read it the way we read it, okay? Then I'm going to give it to you. You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but by my Father who is in heaven. Now that leads us to the next two verses, which leads us to this dynamic word called the church. Verse 18, And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When we read that, well, here's, that's how we read it. He says, and who do you say that I am? And Peter would turn around and say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen? Yeah. And Jesus said, well, blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you. That's not how it went. Let me show you the dramatics of how it went. Because first realize the, the reality of this revelation that came to Peter didn't come in the, tabern in the temple, did it? He wasn't in church. He wasn't in church, was he? So he wasn't there just dining on the appetizer. He had an intimacy with Christ. They, all these men, they were sold out to Christ. They gave up everything to follow him. So all of a sudden, they all heard this voice that was coming from heaven. They all heard a sound. And they all heard a word, a name that came to them. Christos. Christos. But it was Peter. Peter turned around and didn't say, you are the Christ. He said, you! <laughs> you! I know who you are! He was absolutely adamant. Why? Because there were so many that came before Christ. 
that tried to acclaim themselves as Christ. And they were liars. And they were found out. And Peter would have known that. But Peter said, but you, you are the one. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when you are intimate with Christ, and you come to know the intimacy of who He is, then you are going to find out who you are. He said, no longer am I going to call you Simon Barjona. I'm going to let you know who you really are. You are Peter. It wasn't when I was in the church that I heard my ministry. It wasn't that I heard God say that this is what I'm going to do with you. It was outside the church because I was spending quality time in His Word. When you are in the Word of God, in the privacy of your life, that is when you are going to discover the voice of God and who you really are in the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? amen. So he says to Peter, he said, and you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now I came out of a background of religiosity, where I have family members that are still stuck in that religion, and there has been argument over the, over the few times where they said, well Peter is Saint Peter, and upon Peter is how Christ built the church. He built the church on Peter. So you can't, you can't argue with somebody who's really steeped in their religious belief. But that's not the truth. Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter. And the word for Peter is Petro, which is a small stone. A small stone. Jesus said to him, you are a solid, powerful, outspoken stone. But I'm going to build my church on the rock. And the word for rock is is Petra. And Petra means a gathering of many small stones that I am going to bring together, fuse together, joined and bound together in love. In other words, Peter, I'm not building my church upon any particular personality. I'm not building it upon you, Peter. I'm not building it upon any gifting, any call and of the fivefold ministry of any one person. I'm going to build my church upon that of a multitude of saints that are going to come and accept me. They are the small stones that I'm going to join together and they are going to make up the foundation of what I will build my church upon. Well, obviously, Peter understood that because in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, Peter makes this statement. He says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So church, the, the, the church is not based on the building of any one person because not one person could ever gr uh, gravitate to the dimension of what the church will be able to gravitate up to as far as a corporate body of believers. Amen? Amen. And so he goes on and he says in verse 18, and on this rock, on this gathering of the many small stones, I am going to build my, everybody say it with me, church. church. Say it, church. church. That's the first time that the word church is actually mentioned. And it comes to us in a Greek word, ekklesia. Ekklesia is a very interesting word. Because ekklesia is a Greek word. Ekklesia was known by the Greeks because the ecclesia was where the, the Greek leaders, the elders, would go to the city gate and they would legislate all the bylaws and constitutions and rules and regulations of how the people of Greece were to conduct themselves. It was a congress of their day. Just like we have the congress of our day that manufactures all the rules and regulations that we as citizens are to abide under. Amen? So the Greeks had the ecclesia. They had the elders that performed this, this uh, joint together group body that were there to put the rules and regulations together. Which kind of brings us to Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, you have a situation where there's this guy, he is a, a silversmith by the name of Demetrius. And he is so angry at Paul that he wants to kill Paul. And he was the Greek craftsman who crafted all the false gods, Diana. Okay? And, and all, he, what he did, he got all the other craftsmen that craft, handcrafted all the other false images. Because you have to understand, in that paganistic world, they would go and buy a whole lot of handcrafted images. 
you would find, as what I read, handcrafted images all over their house. Matter of fact, when Paul went into Athens, he saw that they had all these gods that they worshipped, but then he saw that they had a statue to the unknown God, which opened up a door for him to be able to propagate the truth of Jesus Christ. Well, as he's telling people about Jesus Christ, there had been a lot of Greeks that were converted. They came and they started to accept Christ. So Demetrius, what it was doing, it was hitting him in his pocketbook. So he rallied all the other craftsmen, said, we've got to kill this guy. He's going to hurt not only us, but he's going to hurt all the other craftsmen all over Asia. So they put a siege and brought an assault against Paul. But then you come to find the city clerk of that city of Athens rose up to defend Paul because he didn't want to see Paul get destroyed. And here's what he said in verse 38. He said, therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful, everybody say, assembly. assembly. There's the word ecclesia. So when you understand that the ecclesia is a group of people governing rules that have already been set forth, then you have a better understanding of the church. The church, once again, is not just a place once a week where you get the eebie-jeebies, you get the goosebumps, and you feel good. Amen? That's not what the church is all about. The church is a collection, it's a gathering of a legislative body of believers that are there to take the rules, the guidelines that have already been set by the handbook that has been given to us by the Bible, and therefore we are to take what heaven has offered to us, and we are to watch over and govern the earth and bring order not only to our lives, but to the lives of others. Amen? It's kind of like this. The United States of America, we have, we have these embassies all over the world, do we not? Those embassies are in other cultures. But even those other cultures, as nasty as they could be, where the embassy is at, that embassy is on sovereign territory. Because that embassy doesn't belong to that culture. That embassy belongs to the United States of America. And the ambassador that stays at that embassy is not part of that culture. That ambassador belongs to the United States of America. And the ambassador dare not ever speak his own words or think it out doing his own thing to try to negotiate a circumstance. No, the ambassador only listens to what America tells him to do. He says what is said to him to do. He does what is told him how to do it and nothing more and nothing less. That's what an ambassador does. But if the ambassador or someone that's a United States citizen in that foreign culture is now under some kind of watchful eye because maybe the laws of that land is trying to incriminate the ambassador or another citizen and trying to get them put in prison, if they can get back into the gate of the United States Embassy, they are safeguarded. Why? Because they have come back into America. The embassy is a little bit of the United States of America, but a far way from home. So guess what the church is supposed to be? We are supposed to be a little bit of heaven, a far, far distance from home. We are to be the ones that we listen to what heaven is saying, and we take the guidelines of heaven, and we follow pursuit, and we do exactly what God's word says, and not our word. That's why Matthew chapter 6, verse 10 says, it says these words, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven is the homeland. You and I are the ambassadors. And therefore, we are to carry out whatever is being given to us. Amen? Amen. We are to bring a miniature reflection of heaven on earth. So you come to realize in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. And by the way, you know it's his church because he says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Think about that. He said, I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Is the gates of hell prevailing against the church? If a church of any sort has the gates of hell overcoming it, then guess what? That is not a church that Jesus Christ is part of. If you find that a church is falling apart, obviously it's because the leaders of that church have built that church 
on human application and they're using the name of Christ. That is as far as he goes. When you come to see what Jesus said, he said, I will build my church. Jesus is moving in an offensive move. Satan is, is doing a defensive work. He's trying to destroy the church. But if, if Jesus is on the offense, and we are the ambassadors of Christ, then we should be moving offensively. We should not be moving defensively, trying to stop Satan. No, Satan should be trying to stop us. He should try to, he, be, he should be having a nervous breakdown because we are carrying out the guidelines of God's Word and we're not going to stop. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. And we're not going to stand there saying, I will worship you. No, you're going to dance. You're going to shout. You're going to sing. You're going to bow. You're going to praise. You're going to have joy in your heart. You're going to have a smile on your face. No weapon formed against you, you know in your heart, is going to prosper. Amen. Amen. Amen? But notice Jesus didn't say, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against me. Him, Jesus. He knew, he knew better. He is omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful. He was the creator of Satan. How could the creation think that he could ever overcome the creator? Amen? Amen. And so Jesus didn't say, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it or overcome me. He said, the gates of hell shall not overcome my church. My church. Well, if Jesus said that, then he knew something. He knew in order for my people, he knew, he, he knew that in order for my legislative body of my ecclesia, for them not to be overcome, I need to give them power. And so he wants us in the face of the enemy to conduct and manifest heavenly authority to let the enemy know you have no ability to overcome us. So how did that happen? What did Jesus give us? Well, look at verse 19. We're almost done here. He said, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys are, they, they give you access. If you have a key, you can either lock or unlock. You can either start or stop. You can have a key, but if you don't know how to use it, you can have a car outside. You can have a $30,000, $40,000 automobile with a two, or maybe, I don't know what a key costs, 69 cents, maybe a $100 key with a fob. But when you have that in your pocket, if you don't know how to use that key, you're going to walk home because that any bitty key, you don't know how to operate in the ignition, so therefore it's of no value to you. Amen? Amen? But we come to find that Jesus has given us keys. He said, I will give you the keys. Not the key. He didn't say key. He said, I will give you the keys. Why? Because he said, he, as you go back here, he says, and the gates of hell. The gates, everybody say it with me, the gates the of, gates hell. of hell. hell. In other words, Satan has many gates. The elders of Israel, they would get by the city gate. That's when they would that they would legislate the rules and regulations. Well, hell has gates. Hell has gates where the powers, the rulers, and the principalities gather together so as to concoct plans, so as to unleash those plans and try to come against the church of Christ. But Jesus said, no way. I'm giving you keys, not key. I'm giving you keys. And those keys... If you learn how to use them, you will lock the gate and the enemy will not be able to come at you. He will not be able to overwhelm you, overcome you, because you will have authority over the powers of the air. So how do we, how do we obtain these keys? And therefore, how do we use these keys? This is, the, this is the great failure in the church. First of all, the keys are never going to be received only by coming on a Sunday morning and listening to the appetizer. You don't get keys then. You get keys when you have a desire to, to spend time in the intimate, an intimate time with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Because what's going to happen then is this. Maybe you're going through a time of financial destitution. Maybe you're having a problem with sickness. Maybe you're having a problem with relationship. Maybe you're having a problem in marriage. Maybe you're having a problem with children. Whatever the problem is, how many of you know, for every pollution, God has a solution in His Word. Yes. Amen? Amen? So whatever your problem is, then what you do is you go to the Word of God. 
You're not going to get it by a Sunday morning sitting on the, the derriere and going outside and say, well, I've received it. No, you've got to spend time with the Lord. Yes. You've got to spend time with the Lord. And as you begin to open up the Bible but, and you pray first, God will bring you to a place where He has a word that is going to heal you. It's going to set you free. It's going to lock the door of that gate. And so what you do is you're reading, then all of a sudden, He's going to give you a nugget. It's going to come from underneath the surface of His Word. And that nugget is going to come out. And now He's giving you a key. Now you have a key. You have what is called a rhema word. It is a word in season. It's not just a generality. I mean, you're going through a heavy time and you read and say, well, Judas hung himself. Well, what good is that for you, right? But when you read a word where you found that Jesus healed the sick, and there that word pops out at you, Jesus wants you to hold on to that word. That is a rhema word that God wants you to hold on to. But then he wants you to activate that word. How do you activate the word? By speaking it. Amen. You have to speak it. That's why the Bible says the tongue has the power of life and death. And you will love it and eat the fruit thereof. If you're speaking about the commotion, you allow the gate to keep on flooding in your parlor. But when you are reading the Word of God and you are in a consistent time where you have a need and you are spending quality time with the Lord and God begins to give you a rhema word that is so powerful and so necessary for what you're going through, you take that word, even though it doesn't seem like the most likely word to speak at the most likely time, you speak it by faith. And when you speak that word, you are declaring the outcome that you're about to see. Amen? Amen. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, that whatever you speak is either going to set you free or condemn you. He said the choice is yours. You can either speak and tell people what Satan is doing to you and it's going to absolutely violate you. Or you can speak what Jesus has given you because you've spent quality time. It may take time. It may take a while. It's not, maybe it's not going to happen overnight. It may take months. It may take a half a year. I don't know. But you hold on to that rhema word. And I guarantee you, you have a key. And as you open up the, and you speak it by faith, you are locking the gate of hell. And therefore, the influence of satanic influence is not going to be able to overcome you. Amen? Amen. And this is what happens when you do that. Matthew 16, 19. Whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Bind means restricted for a season. You say, well, wait a minute. I, I use the, the rainbow word. I speak it by faith. The gates of hell that are trying to offend me are locked. Satan can't come in, but it's only for a season? Yes. Yes. If you go back to Matthew chapter 4, it says that Jesus was offended by Satan. Satan tried to get him to jump from the high place and tried to get him to turn the, the rocks into bread. And after Jesus overcame him, by using the word, it says Satan left until another opportunity. Because why? He's an opportunist. He will wait until he can get you alone again on that small, lonely time, on a month of temptation, where it's just you and God and Satan. And Satan is going to try everything in his power to try to get you to let go of the key. Amen? Amen. But you have to understand, to restrict Satan, it is only but for a season. But when you, when you loose the power of God, it is also only but for a season. Why does God do it that way? Because He wants us to keep on fighting. He wants us to keep on moving. Because if you come to a place where you sit and say, huh, I've defeated the enemy, he's not going to bother me anymore, you end up sitting in a seat of complacency, and you'll find yourself sitting and stewing in a seat of death. That's what the Bible says. He that sits in a seat of complacency will die. Amen? And so whatever you do, as you take the rhema word that God gives you because you're spending quality time, private time with Him, and you begin to speak that word by faith, you are going to find that heaven has your back. So here's the question I leave you with. How can it be that we have all these churches, we have all these pastors, we have all these officials, we have all these prophets, and we have all these evangelists, we have all these teachers, we have all these leaders of all sorts, and yet we come to find that there's such a mess that's going on, even in the church, it's because nobody understands the reality of their duty. They don't understand the reality that God had brought them in 
to groom them and grow them so that they would be the legislators that God had called them to be, that, he would legis that they would legislate His Word and govern over every situation that you have the privilege to rule and reign, but you're not going to rule and reign by your own human capacity. Your words mean nothing to Satan. When you turn around and say, get behind me, Satan, you have no ability, he's laughing and spitting in your face. But when you take the word of God and you speak it by faith, that's when you are going to see ruling and reigning and power and authority. And that's when you're going to see what the enemy has been doing to you, he's going to fade away. He has to get out of the way because what God promised that he's going to do for you, it's going to be a brand new day of sunshine that's about to pour upon you. Can you amen. say amen? Amen. Can you stand with me? If there be any of you that have a need, any of you that are sick, any of you that want to go and say, I want to, I want to take a different turn, I want to get right with God, I want to be stronger with the Lord, I want you to come forward. If there be anyone that needs prayer, anyone that needs prayer, Mike, well, I don't know, put you on the spot, but you can vocally sing that song again. Yeah, sing it again.